So today, uh, I know I would like for us to open up our Bibles to um, Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen and fourteen. If you are there, let me know. I'll read the verse. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse thirteen and fourteen. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. So this is like Paul reaching out to the Thessalonian church, right? Through his word, through his letter, right, actually. And uh, he's giving them instruction and he's reminding them of one thing. The thing is, the first thing that he's reminding is the salvation through sanctification by the Spirit. What does it mean? I mean, it's like a bunch of like big words that are packed up there, right? What does it mean? The sanctification by the Spirit of God starts with the justification which comes through the forgiveness of the sins of the individual by the blood of Jesus Christ. So the starting point is the justification of the individual. And then the second point he says is, in belief in the truth. So we have seen sanctification is happening, but where do we see that the forgiveness of sins is through the blood of Jesus Christ? The sanctification process in Matthew 26 verse 28. Matthew chapter 26 verse 28. This is the first time Jesus Christ is instituting his body and the blood that we need to partake in. It's in the new covenant that he is establishing, which is by his blood. In verse 28, it says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So if you have accepted Jesus Christ, which means the blood of Jesus Christ has been poured on you. You know, um, in the old days, right, like, you know, when there is like a sacrifice that is done of the bulls and everything that happens, the blood has been given, but then the sins were not forgiven at that point in time. The blood of bulls and everything else that has been done in the old covenant, it just gives you extra time to postpone the forgiveness of your sins. The forgiveness of sins happened only after Jesus Christ has shed his blood, okay? And that's when you are justified. When you accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you are justified. And then the sanctification process is going on. In all our lives, including mine and every Christian that has ever lived on this planet, the sanctification is the repetition of the, the sacrifice of and the blood of Jesus Christ that has been given, that any time you fall, you fail, you need to ask for his favor. Repent and ask for forgiveness. And the blood of Jesus Christ is right there to give you that forgiveness. So that's the sanctification journey that he talked about, right? And then comes the second one, which is the belief in the truth. This whole thing, um, you know, we all know this, it all started, right? When did you first understand who Jesus Christ is? That's a belief in the truth. I mean, this is what he's explaining there, where it says it started when you heard the gospel. Somebody has to tell you the gospel, like how Priyanka is sharing, right? Like they are going there to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about God and Jesus Christ to the people that are there. Somebody has to hear it and somebody has to be there to tell it, right? So this is what he's saying. 
and the belief in the truth, verse 14, to which he called you by our gospel. Whose gospel is it? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, shared by Paul and his friends to the people in Thessalonica. So somebody has to go and tell the truth. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only way to go to heaven. That's the truth that somebody has to say and somebody has to hear, right? So all this thing that we have, have experienced it, we have heard the gospel through somebody, through your friend or through your pastor or through something, through YouTube or through wherever, right? You have heard the gospel. You have accepted that, believed that as a truth in yourself. And then you are being sanctified right now. All this for what? Why do we need all this to happen in our lives? And it's already given very clearly in the same chapter, the same verse, verse 14. For the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What will happen to each and every Christian towards the end of it all is that they will get, they will obtain the glory of who? Glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can we be the partakers of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it even possible? Like as a human being with such a filthy mind, filthy attitude, filthy things that we do, is it even possible to become a person who can partake in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ? Word says it is possible. And we need to believe in that, right? So how is what we will have to understand, right? For obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3 verse 21. Philippians chapter 3 verse 21. Amen. I have a different translation. I'll read it from this. Who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. He can subdue even your and my mind to himself. He can do that. He is able to do that. So only because of him, because of Jesus Christ, we will be able to, because he is ready to transform our lowly bodies into the glorious body that Jesus Christ has taken. The glory of the Lord Jesus Christ will be shared with us. That's the truth that we need to understand. This, of all these things to happen, verse 15, again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, if you continue reading, it says, therefore, brethren, after saying all this, right, like Paul says, therefore, brethren, meaning like therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand fast and hold the traditions which you are taught, whether by word or by our epistle. And that is the, you know, message for today. What are we living for as Christians? What is our ultimate goal? Where do we end up? Right? For that, Paul clearly calls out to stand fast or stand firm. Stand firm on what? In Matthew 24, verse 13, it says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So we need to stand firm and stand fast that we will be able to get saved by Jesus Christ at the end. Just because we have accepted Jesus Christ doesn't help us to save ourselves. We need to stand firm in his word, in his teachings, and in the traditions which were taught by the word of God and by the epistles that Paul and Peter and John and everybody has written. We need to hold on, even James has written, right? All of it, we need to understand it, not just in our minds but rather do it in action right that's what is important that's why here Jesus clearly calls out right after end times right what he says is 
He who endures to the end shall be saved. Same thing we are talking about. Stand firm, stand fast, but not to the moment that you are in right now, but stand firm and stand fast till the end. That's the important thing. Yeah, okay, today I was able to do uh, no bad stuff and, you know, I was able to worship God and, you know, my mind is clean and everything. Yeah, great. What is tomorrow doing to you? What is day after tomorrow doing to you? What is next month? What is next year? How long you are going to continue? You have to continue till the end, living with him, living with Jesus Christ. It's not just a one day, two day thing. We have to constantly do it till the end. And what is in it that in the end that is promised for a Christian? So the thing is, there are so many promises towards the end times that God has given. And the same word of God which has created the heavens and the earth at the beginning of the world, right? Beginning of earth and the heavens. The same word of God has given enough information in the Bible about the end times also what will happen, right? Do you know that it's the same word of God that promises for the people who have been written their names in the book of life that there is a end events that's going to happen just like how the word of God has shown and we can see the heavens and the earth today as we walk out we are on planet earth by the way and we're looking into the heavens we have like the sun and the moon and the stars and everything that has been ever created just by the word of God okay God created the earth and then the heavens have to be created to protect it like sun and the moon created on the fourth day by the way. So all these things that have happened we can see with our own naked eyes. But there are things that were foretold right towards the end there comes the day of the Lord and then comes the new heaven and the new earth. The same word of God with its power that created the heavens and the earth has also declared certain things that are known to each one of us here who are Christians when we read our Bibles that there is something that is going to happen at the end of the world. That is the new heaven and the new earth. So where do we see that? In 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 5 onwards I will read. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 5 onwards. But they deliberately forget. This is about talking about the people who call themselves Christians, but then don't believe in the word of God to the point where it needs to be believed. False teachers and false preachers, right? They believe and they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens and the earth came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. This is talking about Noah's flood. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So there is a day of the Lord, day of judgment, day of like, you know, a thing where the destruction would happen. To the same heaven and earth that we are watching and seeing and enjoying today. This is the word of God that declared that this is going to happen. Verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? So knowing this very fact, knowing this very truth, that the word of God that created the heavens and the earth will also have the same power to destroy them with a fire. Knowing this fact, how it happens, you know, all that thing, like, you know, we can discuss that later. But then you know for sure that this is the word of God. God declared this that will happen. And you know that it will definitely happen. Because when it is there in the word of God, it's the truth and it will happen. Right? Knowing that fact, that's what Peter is questioning. What kind of a people ought you to be? Ought you and I to be? What kind of a people we need to be? And he, it's just a rhetorical question. He just gives the answer right there. You ought to live holy and godly lives. Amen. Knowing all these things, right? And then we will go to a lot of information. I'll, I'll share even more information. It's what's going to happen at the end of the earth, like end of everything, at the day of judgment and after that, right? What's going to happen? 
the day will bring about and I would like to read verse 11 and 12 actually 12 as you look forward to the day of the Lord and at the speed it's coming we think it's slow from a human mindset from a human thinking okay my father's generation has come they're still at their old age and my grandfather has come and before that even this word was written 2000 years ago it's I, I think we understand that okay time in the human sense in a human sense like you know what we are seeing is okay days go by months go by years go by decades go by centuries go by and even a thousand years millennials go by but then oh where is he coming and that's what like the question that you will have to face from the believers who are not really believing the word of God these are the false believers false prophets and false teachers they will come and question you when you strongly live in your faith and say that God is going to come there is a second coming there is a day of judgment God is going to come and there is going to be a new heaven and new earth your answer to those people needs to be from the word of God yes he said it he has said it once we can see the heavens and the earth still according to his word they are working and then he also said there is a day of destruction which we don't know the timetable but God has a timetable and that timetable is running at a speed that God's speed and that's what Peter is calling out here the day of the God and the speed at which it's coming and God has a timetable by the way we don't know maybe his timetable just the day of the judgment can happen any moment the rapture and then the day of judgment the rapture and then the day of judgment it could happen any moment any time we think that okay there is like several centuries we don't know we might think that but we don't know we have to be very careful that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat this is very clear like peter is like all out on it he knows this because he has spent like three and a half years my dear brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ there are so many things they have discussed if if all those details were given I mean the books will not contain all the details that Jesus Christ has said and done in this world right the information that is enough for us to understand what God's plan is from the beginning the Word of God that declared the creation of the universe Will, has already declared that there is a day of judgment and destruction okay knowing this what are we ought to do is the question that Peter is given now verse 13 2nd Peter chapter 3 again but in keeping with his promise what is this the word of God that he has given so far is a promise that God has given him that we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells the sin that we see around us the nonsense that we hear around us the ungodliness that we see around us all of this will go away in the new heaven and the new earth and how do we know that and I would like for us to go to Revelation chapter 21 Revelation chapter 21 you guys can take turns and read like three verses at a time and we can go through the whole chapter or I can read the whole thing whichever way you want now I saw a new heaven and a new earth mm -hmm. for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away also there was no more sea then I John saw the holy, holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride alone for her husband and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4 onwards, if somebody else can read till 6. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. They shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. They, they shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Amen. True and faithful words, yeah, verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give, I will give of the fountain of water, of life, freely to him who thirsts. 
Yeah, verse 7 onwards, if anybody else can read to 10. Those who are rebellious, they mm. will inherit all this. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the wise, the murderers, the sexual immoral, sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning. So, this is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Mm. And he carried me away in the spirit to the mountain, great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Mm. Verse 11 onwards till 13, somebody can read. He showed us the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious pearl, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. These were Three plagues on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city. No, I think 14 onwards we'll have somebody else read. 14 through 16. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gate, and its when he measured it, he found it was a square, as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were 1,400 miles. Then he measured the wall and found them to be 216 feet thick. The wall was made of jasper. Yeah, I think we can give others um, 18 through 20. Somebody else can read. can read verse 22 till 24. Have you ever understood the breadth and the length of this um, chapter? Revelations, chapter 21, Revelation 21, it's talking about the final, the end state of like what's going to happen as we have seen in the um, second Peter chapter three, right? Like you know, we are promised about this, right? In the verse 13, chapter three, second Peter, it says, but in keeping with his promise, 
We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. I want us to focus on um, the new heaven and the new earth a little bit today. What is our end state? Where is the Christian going to end up? What are we doing all these things that we are doing in this earth for? Right? Because we, we always know, we always have heard it, right, thousand times already that, yeah, we'll be living forever. We'll be living forever. Okay, what, what does it mean? What are we doing? What are we doing in the eternity? The word of God that promised the heavens and earth, which created them, is going to destroy them. And then there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven, right? So in this new earth and new heaven, and we don't know, by the way, if, if he renews the destroyed earth, because if you're set on fire and everything is like clearly like, you know, it's gone, like it's completely melting out or whatever it is, right? But he can make it back to a better universe again. A newer earth, where by the way, there's no sea. I don't know if you've got that point. <laughs> so when whatever waters that we're seeing here right now in the earth that was originally created, separated by waters, with waters, and then the water deluged and then destructed the earth, that's all Noah's flood, by the way. The water that was separated from the earth that went up has come down at this renewed again, right? Like it has to uh, take a new form, new shape, new uh, vegetation, everything has to be renewed there. That's the Noah's destruction. But then the second destruction the word of God talks about is going to be with the fire. But right? after that is where God is going to give you a new earth and a new heaven. And there is no more sea on that one. And then verse 2, right? There is something called as New Jerusalem that is being built in heaven, right? Coming down out of heaven from God. This is like the New Jerusalem. And I don't know if you have gone and uh, caught that uh, verse that sister has read, um, where the length and the breadth and the width are equal. Meaning, we all know cuboid, right? Everybody has learned math in cuboid. <laughs> a cuboid is like, you know, you just, you know, um, the length and the breadth and the height. All three are equal, right? Um, and one side is 1400 miles. You all can understand, I think I read, I heard it in like one of the sermons when Pastor Mark was giving like a long time back. The distance from Los Angeles to New York City is 1400 miles, almost. Imagine that much height. Imagine that much height and that much breadth. Length, breadth and the height is 1400 miles. For it to land on earth with water, it won't, it won't happen, it, you know, it can't happen. So that's why God said no sea. I will land the thing from heaven where the water will not be there. But there will be water, living waters, but then not like the sea that we are seeing right now. Okay, so what's going to happen is this is the new place where the Christian is going to live in the new Jerusalem. Okay, so uh, we need to understand that in this place, God himself will be with his people. Right, that's what we have read in the verse... Uh, yeah, verse 3 says, God himself will be with them and be their God. We don't need um, an imagination that, okay, my God is there somewhere in heaven um, and I'm trusting by faith and things like that. Faith is done. Your faith will take you to the deep of faith where you can see things in the naked eye. In that new earth and the new Jerusalem, right? And he himself will come and wipe away every tear. There's so many tears that human, and especially, you know, a human being, woman, especially more, has shed the tears. But God will be there to wipe those tears. As a father, he'll come, sit with you. He will understand what pain you are going through and what you have endured. And if the tears are there, he is going to be there to wipe those tears from your eyes. Okay? There should be no more death. 
death is given up, death has been bound in the fairy like lake of fire, right? So death is no more, no sorrow, no crying. Once he wipes the tears, there's no more crying after that, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's no more pain. All the former things have passed away. The pain and the suffering that a human experiences in this side of the world will no longer be there at the end state of the Christian. When I'm talking about Christian, not just a believer. Christian who stands firm till the end. And that's the one who is going to be saved. Okay, we need to stand firm and, and knowing all this, right? Like, you know, the question is still there. I mean, keep thinking about what, what kind of a person you ought to be knowing all these things, right? Keep that question in your mind. And <clears throat> Jesus Christ himself will be there, right? The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And he is going to give from the fountain of water of life. How are we going to live forever? The living waters that will give you the life are right there. And you're going to live forever and ever. As long as you are taking that water, you are, you are, you are with God. You will be there forever. He who overcomes shall inherit all these things. He's talking about the life that we have to live on this side of the earth. We need to be the overcomer in our life that we are living here. Not like a person who is like constantly doubting God, constantly doubting things, how will happen, constantly. No. Live like a person who knows who your God is. God has promised so many things. We are seeing all those promises that he has done. And he has already promised a, you know, many big things for the Christian in the future. So live like a person who knows the heavenly things. What's going to happen for you in the future? Live like that person. We don't need to worry about anything that happens in our lives. Because he is the one who has put you here for a purpose. And he knows where you will end up. If we stand firm. Alright? And the thing is, this is, this is something for the woman, actually, you know, in the New Jerusalem, the foundations, what are they laid off uh, with? All the foundations of the wall are decorated with what? Precious stones, man. Like 12 different kinds of, you know, for finding um, a ring with a topaz, like a small stone. Uh, you know, if you go to Macy's, it will be like $3,000, the original MSRP price. And then they'll put a sale for like 60%, 70%, still it's like $1,000. <laughs> 1500 like what? 1500 for the small stone of topaz, like a blue color one, like emerald, like a green color one, like what? What is it all about? It's there all over, like this, the foundations, imagine like 1400 miles. Length, breadth, and the height. And the foundation of it has to be like so huge, so big. You know, all the women should be happy there. Like, wow, this is this stone, crystal line, this, that. And then you will be walking on the streets of gold. You don't need to wear it anymore. You just will throw it on the floor and then you'll walk around on that gold. What? This is unimaginable place. Like, you know, that's the end state of a Christian who follows, who endures. And, and then he has, he has reached that stage. Where you don't need to worry about anything, like you know, all these things that we worry about and then you know spend all of the life and energy and money about is like nothing there. And the biggest thing that I see is a pearl, with one single pearl, you can build a whole gate. Right? Have you seen that? The Twelve gates were pearl. These are like dinosaur pearls. <laughs> okay. The pearls where, they, where these gates are done is like each individual gate is like one pearl it seems. So imagine if that kind of a pearl is there, I mean, there will be like normal pearls will be like rolling on the floor, like I don't know. I mean it's like crazy, crazy thing that we, that we can imagine here, right? But why, why am I talking about all these things? We need 
to understand that in eternity, God has established everything that we desperate or we are desperate for here in this world. It's nothing for God. It's nothing for Him. It's huge mansions. I mean, I don't know how many Christians will live there in that 1400 mile. I mean, imagine like a 25 story apartment building, right? Like in Dubai and like, you know, maybe some places where like a tall buildings where the whole thing is like uh, different, different, different types of apartments and things like that constructed for a 25 story building. We will be like, wow, Burj Khalifa, what happened? Like, you know, this, this is like, no, this is all nothing in the sight of God. And that's the end state of a Christian. All right. And this is the big thing, right? Verse 22, no temple, no need for sanctuaries, no need for temples, no need for churches, no need for anything, anything of that sort. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, they are the temple, they will live with you. Can we imagine, like, Father God, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit God are right there with you living with you in that end state right there is no need for sun and that's why he just melts them away sun and moon are no longer needed the, the glory and the, the radiance of his glory and the light that will emanate there is no need for sun and moon you will have light always there is no night by the way that's what we have read there is no darkness no night you will be there in that light, in the presence of the Lord, forever and ever and ever and ever. So what is it that, that needs to be done for from our side? We need to make sure that your name is still written in the book of life. That's what you need to be able to do your hard work for. Make sure that everything that you're doing here it, it ensures that your name is still there. In the, your, your name should not be brought out. Yeah. Be very careful about it. That's why Peter, right, in verse um, here, like verse 13, is saying, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth, where righteousness is dwelling right and Paul is questioning right what are we going to do and Peter is questioning the same thing like what kind of a people we ought to be in verse 11 so with that I would I know I'm getting over a little bit um, one practical thing that I would like for us to look at before we close up one practical thing, James 4, if all, if all of you can open up to book of James, chapter 4. So one practical thing that we need to learn how we can continue to live, to stand firm, steadfastly in the word of God and not deviating from it. One practical thing, as we all know in 1 John 2, 16, right, these are the things of the world. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Pride of life, how we can avoid, is what James calls out in the chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that you battle within you? Your desire is, you desire but you do not have, so you go and kill. You covet but you can't get that what you wanted so you quarrel and fight you do not have because you did not ask God even when you ask you did not receive it because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures this is like a very strong word here verse 4 it says you adulterous people don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. 
And do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? We'll come back to that verse. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will free from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in the judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your name? So with all this thing, like the pride of life as an individual, you think you are somebody. You think you are like somebody who can judge others around you. You think you are somebody that can create this like a feeling inside you that whatever I need, whatever I demand, things will happen. Things should happen. But you are asking and doing things with wrong motives. God is not going to honor that. So it's very clear one practical way that we can stand firm, stand fast and follow the word of God, follow the epistles is to get rid of the pride of life. Get rid of the fact that you think you are greater than anybody. The word clearly calls out in some other chapter, some other book where consider others as more important than you. Paul writes that. That's when we can live in unity and we can love each other. But if you think you are higher than somebody, you will look upon, down upon them. You will think that like, you know, they are like not able to do things in the right way because you know what is right, you know what is great. Which is a wrong thinking by the way from your heart. So if you, if you offer instead of living a haughty life, a prideful life, but if you offer forgiveness to those people around you, you will be able to follow the instructions that were given by God through his word, through his epistles, and continue to be a better person. One thing that I'm calling out for each one of us, including me, if you have not forgiven somebody in your heart, today is that day. You can go ahead and forgive that person and call that person, tell him that you have forgiven him. But if you have done something wrong against somebody, if you have to ask for forgiveness, go ahead and do that too. Ask for forgiveness. Bring your pride down. The pride of life, according to James, is not going to be helping anybody. Because there will be desires that you want to do, but then you can't do them. One thing that you have to remember, that I said, we'll come back to verse 5. James 4, 5. I want one of you to read it again. So verse 5, I'll read it again, this is NKJV. Do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs, who is he? This is God. He jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. When we, when we accepted Jesus Christ, the spirit 
out of the trinity within the human body the body our soul and our spirit spirit comes alive in our body okay so the spirit was given by him to live inside each one of us and he is longing for that to come back to him he is jealously longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in us the scripture clearly is calling out that this, this spirit belongs to god the spirit has to go back to god and that's the whole thing that we have seen like in the new glorious body we partake in the glory of our lord jesus christ and then enter into that new jerusalem on the new earth and the new heaven how is it possible unless your spirit is ready to go back and god is waiting for this to live in eternity with him in a better place not rot in hell not rot in hell because that's his heart if there is anything that we can do to stand firm till the end we need to start doing it now if there is anything like you know either you forgive somebody or you ask for forgiveness from somebody or you think of like this evil things like get it off them from your thing resist the devil flee from it right all these things if we have to do to stand firm we have to do it why there is a much better place that god has established so let your hearts be not troubled verse uh, 1 of john 14 with this will close john 14 verse 1 do not let your hearts be troubled just because we have heard about all these things and how we have to conduct ourselves yes there is a god in heaven there is a holy spirit who is living inside each one of us and who can help our spirit to do the good things right so do not let your hearts be troubled you believe in god believe also in me jesus christ he says my father's house has many rooms he's talking about the cube part which is like 1400 miles length 1400 miles breadth 1400 miles height huge place mansions can be built there okay football grounds basketball fields like whatever you want like there's no place like you know like that that you that cannot hold the christians that have lived across the whole generations right such a huge uh, place that he's building my father's house has many rooms if that were not so would i have told you that i'm going there to prepare a place for you meaning like he's asking a rhetorical question i'm going there to prepare a place for each one of you to be there with me that's what jesus is claiming and this is the word of god this is a promise the new heaven and the new earth and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come back that's another promise i will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where i am Amen. and we have seen in revelation 21 god the father the lamb is going to be there there is no need for sun and moon all the glory of the lord will shine through the whole halls of the cuboid that is so big that we don't need anybody else but he himself will be there with us and you know the way to the place where i am going he's like you know the way and then very nice after this right like thomas says okay lord i understand but what how, how is the way what is the way lord that's the important words that jesus i mean good that thomas asked that question otherwise we would be like if if the whole passage has ended there and you know the way we will be like wondering like you know breaking our heads like what is the way what is the way what is the way is the way right but then jesus said i am the way the truth and the life so we all know we all have jesus with us we all have the holy spirit god in us only thing that we are called to do is to stand firm and continue our steadfastness of our work with god till the end amen so let's close our eyes and pray gracious lord loving heavenly father lord we thank you lord we thank you for this promise that you have given us 
where we will be there with you in the new heaven and the new earth, Lord, in the new Jerusalem, where you are preparing a place for us right now. Lord, if there is any doubt in any of the people that are listening and that they have a mind, they are thinking that is it true, Lord, help us to realize that this is the word of God that is already proven by the creation of the heavens and the earth that we see with our naked eye. And this is going to happen in the future, Lord, that you have promised after the day of the judgment, after the day of the Lord, there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth that is promised for every Christian. What kind of a person we ought to be, Lord, after knowing all this? What kind of a people we ought to be, Lord, after knowing all this, all these promises that you have given us? We ought to live a holy and a godly life. Lord, help us to, Lord, uh, disengage with all this worldly thinking, the pride of life, Lord, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, Lord, help us to, Lord, all these things that are entangling us, Lord, help us to break loose of it. In the name of